So my name is Paul Kirby, and I'm here um, with uh, Senator Games. Um, Recently, and, Cornwall, actually. We just, oh, my wife moved? and I just moved, yeah, about oh, a month okay. ago. Yeah. Oh, we'll change that in our file here. Then. And um, the Senator's district is the 39th uh, 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 Senate district, uh, which includes also the county towns of Platte, Kilimanjaro, uh, and um, Central and Eastern Orange County and the northern tip of Rockland County. Um, so he's here to uh, for a daily frame and live stream to uh, talk about some of the um, some of the uh, issues that have faced the state legislature this year, uh, and um, and um, talk about whatever comes to mind. So, uh, Senator, if you want to make a uh, you know, opening statement uh, uh, to our viewers, uh, feel free to do so. And uh, maybe some of it focusing on the change of the uh, state legislature uh, in January this year and the session. That went on. Sure. So, so, you know, first, thank you. And I want to express my uh, for having me and for doing this. I think this is a, an important public service that you have folks in here uh, and answering to your readership. So, um, Look, I'm I'm very proud to represent uh, the 39th district, which, as you noted, includes Marlboro, and, and I, you know, I'm honored to succeed Senator Bill Larkin, um, who represented the district for uh, quite some time. I yep. uh, and but look, you know, I I have been around the state legislature for for six years. Uh, this is my first term in the Senate. And um, look, I, you know, I'm a, I've always believed that when government is working and when people in government are there for the right reasons, there's a real capacity to help people, to do good, to make a difference in, uh, in communities and in people's lives. And so that's what I've tried to do. You know, I'm half Greek. My father was born in Greece and, you know, birthplace of democracy. Yes. And, you know, back then, millennia ago, Politics was a noble profession that people got into. Uh, you know, you were representatives of your community, uh, trying to be a voice uh, for the people that you represent. And certainly politics, uh, you know, broadly speaking, has sort of lost its way uh, along the way. And uh, But those of us who, you know, are there to, to try and do good and are there for the right reasons, um, you know, this is still a, uh, you know, this is a position of influence where, where you can make a difference. So that's what I try and bring to this district. Um, and, you know, I, I promise people two things, and I always have, and just really these two. Uh, one is that I'm going to be direct and, and forthright with folks. Yeah. Uh, if I agree with you, I'm going to agree with you. If I disagree with you, I'm going to tell you I disagree with you. I had a town hall yesterday where some anti-vaccine folks were there, and, you know, I no problem speaking with them, engaging with them, but ultimately not yesing them to death, telling them matter of factly, I fundamentally disagree with you. Um, so you know when I'm with you and when I'm not with you on an issue. Um, and, and then second, you know, I pride myself and my office as well. We work very hard. Uh, we put in the hours, 60, 70 hours a week, weekends, uh, nights, and I believe to best effectively do this dynamics what they uh, have been for a very long time. Yes. I, you know, I was in the assembly in the Democratic majority there. I, I was, you know, one of a number of um, now senators who flipped districts in in the last yes. election uh, from Republican and Democrat. And uh, you know, it, it is of utmost importance, and I believe we lived up to this. That uh, two things: number one, that we govern for the whole state. Uh, not just New York City, not just any region. We govern for the whole state. I believe that we did that this year. And here in the Hudson Valley, we have about a half dozen majority members, senators, uh, who helped drive that conversation, which was very important. Um, and, and then second, despite the fact that it's now unified democratic uh, government in, in New York State, uh, it, it's of utmost importance, even more uh, there be accountability, and that includes the legislature. Under no circumstance could the legislature respond along because now everyone is in the same party and get along. Uh, you can get along when you know, there's reason to get along, and you know you've had the debates, and we all settle on an issue. Um, but you know, and I play a role in this as chair of the investigations committee. Uh, you know, I've sort of reinvigorated 
this committee that was just really an in name only investigative committee previously. Uh, and it's it's critically important that Democrats don't just you know. Uh, things under the rug just because Democrats now control government, we have to hold each other accountable. And so I believe we've done that. There's more work to do, um, but certainly I'm, I'm very proud to represent Marlboro, Platykill, this entire district, and, you know, uh, fighting for them these seven months and uh, in the many months to come. Great. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned the change in the legislature, and some uh, Democrats have called this uh, um, the, the work that was done this session, you know, a, a, a huge success. Uh, while the uh, some Republicans, what do you think about that? So first, I would say whether you agree or disagree with most of what was done this year in state government, I think it's indisputable that this was the most active legislative session in generations, maybe ever, uh, both in terms of volume of bills, but more importantly, the the scope of the issues that we tackled really. Every issue, almost every issue imaginable, uh, we took on and debated, uh, and most of which we actually addressed. Right. And so, uh, look, you know, I believe uh, people in last year's November elections made their voices loud and clear that in state government, uh, we're tired of state government and the federal government collecting paychecks but not doing anything on behalf of the people that they represent. Mm -hmm. And so I believe, again, whether you agree or disagree, uh, we took action on almost every issue this year in Albany, from climate change, from tax policy, to education, to uh, good government and disclosures. Uh, you know, you name the issue, transportation, the MTA just south of here, uh, you know, we took on some very difficult and important issues. And so I believe it was a successful session supported most, although not all, of the measures that move forward this year. And I believe it was, more importantly, a successful session for the Hudson Valley. And I'm sure we'll talk about a number of the yeah. issues, and I can elaborate yeah. on that. Um, one of the things, though, that didn't get done, uh, and I know that uh, you have an opinion on this, is the legalization of marijuana. What happened there? So what happened when there is very simple. The votes weren't there. Um, you can't pass something if the votes aren't there. And so, uh, you know, the the latest iteration of the marijuana uh, legalization bill, um, I believe, was a good bill that I would have supported if it hit the floor. And I'd indicated that publicly and privately to my colleagues. I and look, when I during this debate, I was looking for a few points to hone in on that were important to me. Uh, most notably, if we move forward with this, we had to make safety law enforcement because they do legalize and make no mistake you know people should not have illusions that this is um you know black or white here i uh, there's gray area and there are cons as well as pros to this we need to address the challenges as best as we can if we move forward and the biggest one is road safety dwi safety making sure law enforcement has so there resources were things missing. Uh, no, so I'm saying in that last bill, yeah. you had those items. And so that's why I was comfortable moving forward with that bill. Um, but fundamentally, but it didn't get there. It didn't get. And you to have reservations. Um, but there's. But you don't. Uh, that, you last, don't that last bill, I would have supported. Okay. Um, it remains to be seen now what continued negotiations will yield. But fu fundamentally, let me say this uh, you can. Anyone in New York State who's 21 and older, obviously, can go out to a bar any given night and get blackout drunk and die from an overdose. That is perfectly legal as long as you don't get behind a wheel, right? right. You can't overdose with marijuana. There's never been a single overdose death recorded. It's not possible. And so when when and I don't ask this of people uh, facetiously when folks say, oh, well, you know, I've got problems with legalization of marijuana. I respect that opinion. But ask them, well, do you believe we should go back to prohibition? Is alcohol too unsafe? Because actually alcohol is more dangerous than marijuana. So do you believe we should go back to prohibition? Of course, people say no. And so you have this, uh, this inexplicable uh, discrepancy between how we handle alcohol in New York, in the country, and how we handle marijuana. I believe we need to, uh, we need to somehow rectify that. And also keep in mind that that the victims of arrests, and there are thousands of marijuana arrests in New York State, people sent to jail are people of color, 
and young people in New York State. Uh, and so it's uh, it's an issue on many levels. We decriminalized marijuana, yeah, we, which I think is an important step forward, but there's more work to do. Yeah, I mean, some people say that the Democrats, we, by decriminalizing it, legalize it anyway. That's not true. I mean, so you, there's no, you know, what, so regardless of what you feel about legalizing or not, uh, you can't walk into a dispensary. There are no shops. That's what comes with legalization. Mm -hmm. There's access, legal access. Uh, with decriminalization, you don't have that legal access. There are small fines for small amounts of marijuana. We should be apprehending the big drug dealers. They continue to remain, uh, uh, you know, a scourge in many of our communities. Um, but make no mistake, you know, there is a, a strong distinction between decriminalization and legalization. So um, the next session starts um, January of uh, next year. Do you think that in your mind, do you think that this will get passed uh, in the next session? I, I'm not. This will be coming back up again for debate and negotiation. So it will be a live right. issue, so to speak. But if this bill, um, the one that you said was the good one that you would support it. If this bill is the same as that one that you support and it comes to the floor, you'll vote in favor. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, so um, the there are other issues, and you mentioned the uh, uh, vac vaccination uh, issue, uh, but um, you also, um, you you did, um, as a, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right about this, you favored getting rid of the religious exemption um, or, 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 or order for some people to avoid vaccinations of their children. Um, and that was the big item uh, in that bill. How come you did that? So I didn't just support it. I championed the bill and strongly, strongly supported it. I, it's very simple. Um, number one, I, this religious exemption mm -hmm. I, is, is sort of made up. It's pretend because there is no religion that has a problem with vaccines. Uh, whether you're Catholic or Muslim or Jewish, there is no organized religion that comes out and says, oh, you know, we have concerns about immunization. Doesn't exist. And so what we have seen is too many families uh, use this so-called religious exemption as a personal exemption. And a personal exemption is not allowed under New York state law. It never has been. But, you know, they've used this religious exemption to satisfy their, and I'll be frank, conspiracy theories that vaccines cause autism and, you know, other other crazy thoughts that have been uh, um, completely uh, and indisputably debunked. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we operated this year amidst a measles outbreak. In New York State. Uh, in fact, as someone who represents the northern half of Rockland County, yes. this is one of the epicenters of the measles outbreak. Yes. This is a disease that we thought we eradicated, not thought, we had declared we had eradicated 19 years ago in the year 2000. Never in a million years did I think as a state senator uh, in 2019 would I be legislating on how to address a measles outbreak in New York. But here we are. Yep. And so this is a public health crisis. I, now, make no mistake, I would have voted for this whether there was a measles outbreak or not. This is good public policy. This is the right thing to do. And that's why every single health organization, every single science-based organization, all the medical and doctors groups endorse this bill. And that's because vaccines only work when all or almost all of people are immunized. That's what we needed to address. And, and I'm glad we did this year. Yeah. Um, the, the way it works, the, the new rules for people who, for parents who are not vaccinated, uh, who haven't vaccinated their kids, they have to have all of those vaccines before they go to school. Like we're talking about 10 some what? They, they, they need to have the first round of, 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 the, of each of the vaccines by the start of the school year to demonstrate to the school district that they're in the process of being caught up. So you don't need to get all of them by September, but you need to get the first round of the vaccines. Now, some of if, those parents are saying that that many rounds in this period of time may be risky. Is that true? Is that uh, the, the science is indisputable and perfectly crystal clear on vaccines. Vaccines are safe. Uh, you know, I've heard, oh, well, you know, there are children with um, disabilities who can't handle vaccines. There is nothing that demonstrates that a child with disabilities can't handle vaccines, but a child without disabilities can. And so, look, you know, I know that this, this law has caused some concerns with um, 
uh, a number of, of families, uh, but their options are this. No one's kicked them out of school. Uh, their child will only not attend school if they don't provide the vaccines to their children. They get the vaccines, they can go to schools. No one's kicking anyone out of school, as some of the opponents have been alleging. Uh, your options are very simple. Vaccines, homeschooling, or I guess move out of the state, which would be a shame, and I wouldn't want to see anyone uh, uh, we, take that route. We're working on something um, um, about that because the private schools, we have a few around here. Uh, they need to get vaccines Correct. now. And um, do you think that the, many of the parents will 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 say, "I'm not uh, I'm not getting the vaccine, so I am going to homeschool my kids." And, and that will cause, that will be a surge of people doing that and, and um, thereby uh, affecting the enrollments at private schools. I, I, I anticipate there being at least an uptick in homeschooling. Uh, this is what California saw after they passed uh, similar legislation. They saw an uptick in, uh, actually a fairly large uptick in their homeschooling uh, community. And that's all fine. And that's perfectly legal under the law. I will say there's one other option I failed to mention. And that is that a medical exemption still exists. There are some children who why they cannot get a vaccine generally because their uh, immune system is compromised. They have childhood cancer, getting chemotherapy uh, and the like. And uh, that is also not. So if a, if a family, if parents uh, have genuine medical issues with their children that prohibit them getting vaccines, that still exists. Um, but no longer will families be able to hide behind this religious exemption to satisfy their own personal beliefs or conspiracy theories. All right, so that's that. That's one. Um, I think uh, that you uh, again just correct me again, but that you voted against legislation making it legal for undocumented immigrants to get driver's licenses, and that in the uh, past, I think you said that you, constituents had voiced concerns about this to you. So, or. or and why it is that you in favor of this, given the fact that added uh, to, um, I think unanimously, along with the I mean, nobody leaves mid Hudson, which is a group that sort of has, uh, and they had vote. Newberg decided to give municipal IDs uh, to. If you could just yeah explain your position happy to that. so so nobody leaves Mid Hudson is so uh, your the viewers and your readers know where yeah. uh, it is a primary uh, advocacy group for this bill right. in the Hudson Valley yep. um, and so I did vote against this bill people I heard from that I represent uh, were overwhelmingly opposed to this legislation I, and I think that their concerns and you asked me to uh, you know sort of elaborate on what the concerns were that I heard yep. twofold were the concerns. Um, one, I think there needed to be more education on this issue. Uh, there are some folks who no doubt still continue to believe that, uh, that driver's licenses would just be handed out to undocumented immigrants. Um, and that's just simply not the case, of course. Uh, the access is provided. So the undocumented immigrants would have to uh, pass a road test like anyone else, would have to get car insurance like anyone else. Yes. And I think some folks I didn't understand that. And certainly so when I spoke to individuals, constituents, I would let them know that. But there needed to be a broader, better, more robust, lengthier, I think, education before taking up this bill number one. And number two, the other sort of set category of concerns I heard were more fundamental immigration issues where uh, people, whether you agree or disagree, uh, just fundamentally believe that we should not be giving rights to, uh, or privileges rather, to people who are in the country illegally. Certainly, there are certain constitutional rights that are granted to anyone who is residing in the United States. Uh, but there are some folks who draw that line at rights okay. uh, and is, they are not comfortable so granting not privileges. that's with education. Correct. I mean, education Correct. Part. So, so, so ultimately, well, how, do yeah. you, how do you as a senator for you know, New York State, in New York State, feel about 
given driver's licenses to people who are in this country illegally. Yeah, so I, so my vote was uh, an attempt to, to best represent my district on this issue. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about the issue, but ultimately what I will say is that I believe a lot of people would have felt more comfortable taking this up uh, possibly next legislative session, uh, when the education was there and people were fully informed about what the impacts of this are. Now, look, you have lawsuits that are going on and county clerks have expressed or some county clerks have expressed yeah. uh, their own uh, specific concerns. And we'll see if that survives a, a legal challenge. For all we know, we might be revisiting this issue. Um, but I think that it was incumbent upon us to wait until uh, the issue was ripe and that the the public was was fully or at least far better educated on this issue. Okay, so they'll be educated over the next uh, few months before the session starts. Yeah. Um, and and it's all over the place. All you got to do is you know Google it, and you'll find right. everything you need to know. So if you feel that your constituents have been educated enough, come next session if this comes up again, which I I think it will, uh, will you be in favor of it? I. I, I, I'm not comfortable predicting how I'm going to vote on something sort of hypothetically in the future. Right. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, my considerations change if the public dynamics change and the education is there. Uh, so I would reconsider, um, but I can't tell you, you know, with certainty one way or the other how I would vote. Okay. Um, in in, in, in a, a live stream interview we had done with the... Um, um, uh, Assemblyman Cahill, he had said that um, during a recent interview that um, um, that he supports um, doctor-assisted suicide and that he is pushing a bill um, um, uh, to order the health department, um, I guess order is maybe a strong word, but to tell the health department to do a study on this particular matter, doctor assisted suicide. What do you what do you what do you stand on that? Yeah, so this this goes by a few names, right? I mean, so doctor assisted suicide, yeah. uh, aid in dying, yeah. death with dignity, yeah. and um, you know this is this is a very visceral issue for a lot of folks, and it's a very complicated issue. Um, you know, I, I, there are very few individuals, myself included, that have not uh, experienced a family lem family member who has who has suffered from a terminal illness. And, um, you know, so my stepfather had brain cancer many years ago and it was, we all know, knew it was terminal. There was nothing that could be done at the end. And he suffered a great deal. I, uh, you know, this, this legislation would provide an opportunity for victims of these illnesses and their family members to, to make a very difficult decision about perhaps passing more peacefully and not going through uh, what they might consider unnecessary Please pain. The pain. Okay. So, uh, yes, I, I think conceptually it's fair to say that I think you know th this is an opportunity that should be available to people. That said, there needs to be the strictest of safeguards in this bill. And the current bill I do not believe has uh, has adequate uh, strict the safeguards. Been flowing around for a couple, few years. Correct, now, right? and I'll give you one example. So, so right now, uh, when um, the victim of a terminal illness uh, is is looking to sign the document that basically you know expresses they 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 want this opportunity, um, they need two witnesses uh, watching them sign this document. Only one of those two witnesses is required to not be in that person's will. Uh, I believe, you know, okay. in order to, pre to prevent a conflict of interest and perhaps people having, uh, unfortunately, ulterior motives, um, both of those witnesses should be required to not be in that person's will. Okay. Uh, so that's one example, you know, so concept- Something that you have a problem with in the current bill. It needs to be a stronger safeguard, correct. Right. Um, and you- uh... You talked about, um, um, you mentioned Government um, Investigations Committee that you chair. Is that, that, is that the only one? Is that the only one you chair? We all chair one committee in the majority, yeah, okay. correct. So um, so talk to me about that because you said it was, was a, a dormant thing. Uh, and I saw some uh, news releases in, um, uh, and stories about uh, you um, uh, cracking down, I guess, on code enforcement in some of the air, not now particular area, but in others, 
uh, in your district. Um, wh why do you think this is, uh, you know, an important committee to to regenerate? I mean, you, you're saying you're, 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 you're being more aggressive with this committee. And will the committee look into, when I think of government investigations, I also think of investigations into actual legislators who may be involved in wrongdoing. And we've sure. seen that plenty in the past in yep. the New York State Legislature. So give me some idea of what, what, the, what this investigations committee will do. Sure. So I, to, to your first point, um, this was a dormant committee. Uh, the committee would have, you know, one or two public hearings a year, get some TV cameras in front of them, and then the issue disappears. And there were no real investigations that were going on. Uh, so, you know, when I took on this role, it was with the understanding that I would reinvigorate this committee yep. and go figure, make the investigation committee uh, investigating uh, on different issues and, and topics uh, that were important to people. I hired two full-time investigators. This committee has never had investigators before. I, uh, you know, so we just concluded one report, one investigation, uh, literally just this week on code enforcement uh, throughout New York State. We yeah. examined a few municipalities, but make no mistake, uh, our report uh, speaks to statewide practices and highlights deficiencies, certainly highlights some things that are working uh, and that should be brought statewide. And we conclude with uh, recommendations to the legislature, to agencies, and to local officials. We in, we did an investigation that has since concluded on uh, these pharmacy middlemen, uh, these drug company middlemen, uh, about a month, month and a half ago, that are driving up the prices for consumers. And so, you know, we're tackling issues that I believe are of real consequence to the public. We have an ongoing investigation into uh, IDAs and public authorities, uh, of, of which many people have concerns about how these tax breaks are being handed out uh, across state. Pilots, exactly, primarily. Um, we have a number of other investigations that we're beginning to take on that we haven't announced publicly yet. Uh, so, uh, so look, you know, I... Uh, this this committee plays a very important role when it's working, and um, it, it speaks to the accountability that I felt was and shared before that I feel is very important, especially in light of the fact that Democrats control uh, the legislature and the governorship. Uh, this committee's this committee's actions are now more important than ever. Uh, to your question about. Um, I, Corruption uh, within yeah, within impropriety, the, corruption yeah. amongst individual legislators. Yes. I will say that uh, my jurisdiction does not extend to that. Uh, we have an ethics committee that takes complaints and issues about specific members at their committee. Um, certainly, if I had jurisdiction, I would welcome it and I would do what I can there. But uh, about specific legislators, that's an ethics committee question. Okay, so, so which I'm not a member of and don't share. How many? How many? How many uh, members are on the government investigations committee? Oh, we, yeah. So we have uh, we have seven members on our committee. Are they all Democrats? No. No. Okay. So how many are Democrats and how many are Republicans? Every committee is uh, is apportioned. Uh, Democrats versus Republican seats okay. based on the total chamber membership, and so there are five Democrats and two Republicans okay. on the committee. All right. So, um, uh, early, uh, early in the session, I think it was, uh, the legislature passed the um, Child Victims Act. Um, I, I think you voted in favor of that. Um, but now, come August 14th, yep. um, that law takes effect. And we have seen reports uh, 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 from um, newspapers and others. Uh, Reuters in particular, that um, thousands, thousands upon thousands of lawsuits are going to make it into the system yep. um, from lawyers who are collecting information on these on past victims because the age changed, yep. right, to sue. Um, so, uh, I mean, we hear over and over again that New York State uh, court systems are already, uh, you know, clogged up. What do you think about this when thousands of lawsuits are going to get into the system? Do you think there's going to be need for more judges, more uh, more court offices, more, I mean, like just everything? What do you think? Uh, possibly, um, but in no way should that be uh, the reason why we do or don't do something in New York State is because, you know, we might need to staff up uh, in, in a certain place or on some certain level. So uh, make no mistake, New York State prior to the Child Victims Act had 
the worst statute of limitations in the country when it came to child sexual abuse. Okay. And so the Child Victims Act, as you noted, extends the statute of limitations. And importantly, starting on uh, Wednesday next week, uh, will reopen a one-year window for victims who missed a chance because of these ridiculous previous statute of limitations to bring a case within that one-year window and get some justice. So one-year window meaning not the age limit that's in place now. Correct. The one that was in place oh, was like 23. So, something. so correct. It was 23. So if uh, you're 24 now yes. and uh, you were in cover under the statute of limitations previously and you missed a chance and now you're ready to look, it's a very difficult, you're 24 now. You're 24 now. You now you've, now you've got a one year window. Um, so, 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 so that's, uh, that's an important component. And that one year window starts next week on Wednesday. So look, will there be thousands? I think there may be thousands of, of cases brought, uh, but these individuals deserve to have their day in court, get some justice. Uh, certainly they'll have to present, you know, testimony and evidence if it's applicable. Um, and it's not, you know, a rubber stamp where, you know, they, they get an award. They, they, they need to have a day in court. Uh, they deserve that. That's what this act does. Does it mean we have to staff up or get a couple more judges? Maybe. Um, and I, certainly I know the state will be, the legislature will be communicating uh, with the court administrative offices okay. and um, to making sure that they can handle all of these cases. Um, this, uh, you mentioned that you've been in the assembly for six years previous to your uh, election to the Senate. So, um, and on this issue, um, you have seen it go back and forth uh, before this current session. That's right. Uh, and it usually met with resistance in the Senate, mostly Senate Republicans. Why do you think that was? Uh, it's very simple um, and obvious to anyone who is paying attention. Uh, the the There are a number of senators who balked at moving this bill forward because they bowed to the opposition, the pressure from a number of very powerful groups in the state, Catholic uh, Church, the Catholic Church, one. most notable, most notably, um, certainly also Boy Scouts of America. Uh, and I was a Boy Scout. It's got nothing against Scouts, but the organization was uh, spending heavily uh, to oppose this bill. Um, certainly the Catholic Church was the number one opponent. Um, and for obvious reasons, I uh, under no circumstance should the legislature be shielding um, either the predators themselves or the organizations who had a role in covering up those predators. That's sort of what uh, happened. And now, that, that was what was happening. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad we, we rectified that this year. Yeah. Um, the, the, and this is just for the civil um, uh, Correct. part, right? But there was a, there is a criminal part that was not changed. Correct. Um, um, to extend the statute of limitations. Um, and, and some people say, wow, these guys, you know, they ought to go to jail. Well, so you the, know, the, and, and, yeah, yeah. The so tell me why the, the, the well, so, so there. the criminal statute of limitations actually was extended, but not given this one year window. Um, and you know, we heard from law enforcement groups who, uh, um, you know, expressed concerns about extending that too far. Uh, but certainly, you know, on the civil side, years, wasn't yeah, it? It, it wasn't a large amount of time. Yeah. We extended the civil, uh, um, statute of limitations, lot, like 50 years. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, so, yes, we we did address the criminal side um, a little bit. I believe it should have been more, um, but ultimately that's what was passed. Uh, do you think it is because, I mean, I don't know if you heard this from law enforcement or not, that, you know, evidence uh, for criminal prosecution is much harder to get. Um, um, we I heard that concern. You did? Okay. Yes. All right. All right. So then... Um, there was another one, uh, another bill that was passed, Reproductive Act. Uh, um, Reproductive Health Act. Yeah, yeah. Uh, back early in the session as well. And at that time, there was a bit of a controversy because um, um, there were reports that when it passed, people cheered um, and shouted and, you know, that kind of thing. At the time, um, uh, you know, the governor, I guess, uh, the Empire State Building got lit up pink. Yeah. Uh, and there was a controversy. Assemblyman Cahill, again, uh, had called the cheering offensive. Uh, while you, um, Senator Metzger said, well, this is just people um, 
excited about a victory. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah. Look. I mean, so I know months ago. This yeah. Happened, yeah. But, you know. I. So. So. Look. You know. I. I you can't control what people do, right? I mean, so, you know, there were there were advocates on this bill who have literally been fighting for passage of this legislation for many, many, many years. And so, you know, they were excited and they cheered. Um, I'm not gonna cast aspersions on them. Uh, what I will say about this bill, which is very important uh, because there is, uh, if of, of any bill that passed this year, this legislation had the most misinformation that was out there in the public about it. So let's set the record straight. That was straight. spread, right? It I was. Mean, it spread like wildfire. Yeah. And uh, it was. It's. It's alarming to me that such misinformation could be so widespread. By our um, president of the United States, I believe. He 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 did mention the bill that was passed and yeah. mischaracterized it. So let's be real. This bill, in no way, shape, or form provides abortion up to the moment of birth, or even I've heard after birth, you know, yes. a doctor and a, and, and a mother can decide what to do with, with a new baby. That is outrageous. That is murder. If you have a baby in your hands and you kill it, that is murder. That has not changed. The, the honest, specific truth here is this. New York State's abortion laws, reproductive laws, predated Roe versus Wade. One of, I think, only one or two states that actually had abortion laws on the books that yep. predated Roe versus Wade. Uh, and so this bill simply updated our state's reproductive laws to mirror Roe versus Wade. And Roe versus Wade says this, abortions can happen in a third trimester only if a mother's life or health is in danger. And so what we did, we already had life in our state law. We updated to include health. Make no mistake, U.S. Supreme Court law, Roe versus Wade, is already law of the land. So it superseded what we had in New York. What we did was update New York's law in the event that Roe versus Wade is overturned, which could, which could possibly happen. So we added health, which was already the law of the land, to our state statute. And we did add one further exception. We did add, admittedly, one third, uh, um, an additional third exception for a third trimester uh, abortion. That is if the fetus is unviable. I have yet to meet a person who can argue to me that a mother should carry an unviable fetus to term. Uh, and so that is above Roe versus Wade, but I believe that is non-controversial. Anything else that you hear out there about you know, abortion up to the moment of birth, that is just nonsense. That's, that's complete nonsense. And so uh, that's important to get out there. What we did was, I think, reasonable. Uh, it, 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 it's some, Look, and I deeply respect uh, folks who have a pro-life view on this issue. Um, you know, there, there are many, many constituents, New Yorkers, Americans who genuinely believe, deeply believe that abortion is the wrong thing to do to anyone or be law, period. I respect that. I fundamentally disagree with it, but I respect it. But don't oppose the RHA because you think it does these other things. If you want to oppose it because you're not pro-choice, fine. I get it. I respect that. But don't oppose it because you think it does these crazy things. So the only thing is different uh, between that bill and they almost mirror each other. In terms of access, yes. In terms yeah. of access to abortion, except, that one thing. except for that uh, third exception. Now, the viable. Correct. That's not in. That's Roe. not in Roe versus Wade. Correct. Okay. Let me, uh, if I could circle back to an issue. You mentioned in this one that there was a lot of misinformation on the abortion bill. And you still went ahead with it. But in the other bill that you voted against, the licenses, you said that because there was so much, uh, they, they needed to be more education before taking up the bill. And that seems to be a somewhat of a discrepancy where one, there was a lot of information, you're saying the most ever, but you still went ahead, where, where, whereas the licenses one uh, was not the case. Why did this Right. So the, the misinformation on the Reproductive Health Act came predominantly following the uh, the bill's passage. Yeah. I think that's an important distinction, number one. And shame on all of us in the legislature, the governor, uh, the advocates who have been pushing for this bill to not do a better job following the bill's passage of making sure the correct information was put out there. But that is an important distinction. And, uh, you know, the uh, uh, another thing that I'll note is that on the green light bill, the driver's license bill, is that you know, this is a very complex issue that touches on federal immigration problems. And so it's, it's a, I would argue it's far more layered 
than uh, a reproductive health act, which has been around for, for many, many years. Uh, you know, everyone's debated whether folks are pro-choice or pro-life, the abortion issue. Uh, the driver's license issue is a far newer debate that's happening in the public. Uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, there was a little bit of attention paid to it last year, but really almost all of the attention to this issue started at the beginning of 2019. The choice issue has been around for decades. And so there are a couple of distinctions that I think uh, are important to note. The, the, uh, um, uh, the license is passed, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, but you just voted again. Will you? Will you? Um, uh, as far as Democrats go, how many? How many Democrats did vote against that? They have seven. Seven. Correct. Seven. Okay. None from our area. Uh, the other six were uh, on Long Island. Oh, they were. Okay. Um, you. Um, um, I get releases every so often, of, uh, and I know that uh, some of it doesn't um, uh, is not in our area. But as far as your district goes. You know grants uh you say you 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 care deeply about the district that you uh serve what do you think have been your um um successes so far i know you've not been there a long time in the senate but you were six years in the assembly what yeah. do you think your successes so far are in the district that so, you serve yeah so there are a number of ways to look at i think effectiveness gauge effectiveness um this year one way is that I passed the most bills of any freshman senator uh, in 2019. 59 bills that I authored and introduced passed in the Senate, uh, which was by some considerable amount the most of any of the, I think it's 17 most new. Most important one. I, I, I would argue the most, one of the most important ones, so you're putting, uh, you're putting me on the spot here. One yeah. of the most important ones is offering districts the opportunity to mandate full day kindergarten. Um, right, and right. compulsory full day kindergarten. Yeah. Uh, right now, there are very few districts that require kindergarten attendance. I think this is an important bill. I passed a whole package. That, that of, I just want to be clear. That allows um, school boards to make kindergarten mandatory. Right? Correct. It's not that kindergarten is mandatory because of this bill. That's correct. Right. Okay. I passed a whole package of bills that I carried having to do with better government, open government, freedom of information law, expansion, um, disclosures. I, I I carried a couple bills that I have to do with LLC disclosures that I've uh, passed a number of times in the assembly would always get stuck in the Senate. Uh, one, for example, you have all these LLCs, anonymous LLCs buying up real estate left and right throughout the Hudson Valley, throughout New York state. That's right. Yep. And there are two problems with this, two challenges with this. Number one, I, I think neighbors have a fundamental right to know who they're living next door to who owns the home next door to them. Uh, you shouldn't have to, you know, if you look up in an LLC, it's some PO box in the middle of nowhere. You don't even know who your neighbor is. And number two, um, speaking of code enforcement, uh, if there are problems with the property, if there are code violations with the property, municipalities have an enormously difficult, if not impossible time tracking down who is responsible for this anonymous LLC to get them to fix the problem on their property. Okay. Uh, and so that's another bill that passed both houses this year, and I'm hopeful the governor will sign. So uh, That's not law yet. Not law yet. Okay. Uh, we hope in the next number of months he'll sign it before the end okay. of the year. Um, so, so yeah, look, I passed 59 bills. Many of them are very important. Those are you know, a sampling of them. So you said I. Oh, and, and then there are, uh, sorry, then, go, you know, go ahead. yeah. So uh, again, speaking to the number of different ways you could be effective, right? So another is funding, right? How much funding you're able to bring out of the budget to your district, uh, grants you're able to deliver for your district. Um, and so when folks thank me for a project or for grants, I say, don't thank me. This is just your tax money coming back home. Uh, but my job is to bring back as much of that home as possible. And so we've already, despite just being there for seven months, announced a whole slew of grants throughout the Senate District for schools and libraries and municipalities and infrastructure projects. Uh, next year, uh, we were able to secure funding to make sure that all of 9W through Marlboro is going to be repaved in the spring of 2020. I, I'm working on a grant that I believe we're going to be successful in getting for uh, also Marlboro to uh, create a community center where the old ambulance building yes. used to be. Uh, so, you know, these are uh, these grants are important because the local tax base 
in most cases, simply would not be able to raise the revenue to get these projects That's done. Said, uh, um, you know, over and over again, particularly of the um, CHIPS program that uh, communities um, uh, like this one and others could not pave roads. That's had, right. Had it not been with, without this, is, is that is that the feeling in your district as well? That you know, uh, particularly on this chips program, because I know there was some, not a brouhaha, but the Republicans stood up there and shouted, "We're getting more money for the right, chips right. program." So there are, there are two big programs when it comes to local road repaving, not state road repaving. Yeah. One is CHIPS, yeah. uh, which was fully funded in a budget, extremely important program. Every single municipality relies on this program. The other was the Extreme Winter Recovery Program. Yeah. Uh, this was put in place a couple of years ago when we had uh, the first of a series now of uh, very harsh winters that ate up our local roads. And so disappointingly, this money was not in the budget that we passed. But fortunately, in a supplemental bill we passed in June, we uh, we reauthorized, I believe it's the $65 million for this extreme winter recovery program. Same amount as last year. There was no cut. And that is on top of chips and is an enormous help for uh, local governments to repave right. their roads. You it just um, in passing in your opening statement mentioned the climate change Um Bill, I guess that's, yep. that's really not the name. Is it? Is that the official name of it? Uh, it changed a couple of times yes, the I name, so it it's like anyway, it's CCLPA. You know yeah, right, right. Um, so we, we, we're going to soon. Uh, we may have Central Hudson uh, representatives here as well. Um, and um, do you think um, that uh, this uh, bill uh, will? Um, for Central Hudson to do kind of the green things uh, that I think that Democrats think they should do, uh, and then that that course for doing that will end up with rate payers. Well, mean, so sort of, sort of, yeah. a yes and no. So, okay. so uh, yes, certainly our utilities will have to make changes. Um, but keep in mind, they are not the generators. Central Hudson doesn't run any power plants. Uh, you know, they're just a, the delivery, right? Uh, of of the power. And so certainly they will need to upgrade their systems as the generation changes and, you know, as quite frankly, societal changes take place as a result of this legislation. Um, but, you know, they won't have to shut down power plants or, or, or do very costly things like that. Uh, now, I will say there is a companion bill that did not pass, uh, that should pass, because in order to reach these goals in the bill, uh, effectively get off of fossil fuels completely by 2050, yep. we need an all hands on deck approach. And so this companion bill allows utilities like Central Hudson to get back into the generating business just for renewables. So right now, by law, uh, through deregulation many years ago, right. utilities by law cannot uh, operate a power plant, cannot operate solar fields, cannot operate wind farms. Um, this bill would allow them to operate renewable generating facilities. Central Hudson, for example. Correct. Okay. Uh, and I believe that they're primed to do this. The utilities uh, would be able to supplement the private activity that's ongoing in developing solar and wind and geothermal. Uh, but to get to these goals, these ambitious goals, which are the most ambitious in the country, Yes. We need an all hands on deck approach and that includes the utilities. And so that companion is that are you the sponsor of that? I'm a, I'm not a sponsor. I'm not the sponsor. You're I co sponsor. The no. I, I don't know if I'm a co sponsor or not, but I support the bill. Okay. Um the prime sponsor is uh, Kevin Parker, who's chair of the energy committee in the Senate. Okay. Um, so that needs to, pay. you think it, you think it will uh, go to the floor next session? I'm that hopeful. So, bill. so because the, that's interesting, kind of allowing utilities that have never been allowed before. To well, in a long time, they had been time. many, many years yeah, ago in a long time, um, to participate in this renewable energy uh, program. I'm hopeful it'll get a vote next year. So it was getting momentum. Uh, but the bill really surfaced towards the end of session this year. So there wasn't a lot of time to get it done. So we'll have the whole session next year and I'm optimistic we'll get that done. Good. Okay. So you said I put you on the spot before um, on, a, on one of the bills, the most important. Yeah, thing. sure. So, right, right. So this is uh, putting you on the spot. Too. So next year is you run again. Yep. Are uh, you going to? I intend to at this point. Certainly, you know, I, I'm not thinking about it at this point. Um, I don't see any reason why I would not run again. Um, I, I'm I'm a big fan in 
uh, having as short a campaign as possible. I think campaigns drag on far too long at every level. Forget about president. I mean, you have state Senate campaigns where people announce uh, over a year in advance. And look, I get it. You know, you have to fundraise. You've got to be able to lay groundwork. Um, but certainly as now an incumbent, um, my focus is on government. Uh, once we get far closer to the campaign, I'll make for a formal announcement. But as of right now, I certainly intend to. Okay. And, that, so that, and that's uh, November 2020, that would be, Correct. right? Okay, so uh, we're just about uh, up here if you want to, uh, you know, just wrap it up in a, in, a, in a generalized way. Feel free to do that. Sure. No, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I look forward to uh, meeting folks, especially that I haven't already met in Marlboro and Platticule that are new to my representative area in the assembly. I was further south. Uh, so I'm very proud to represent these couple of towns. I work very closely with the new county executive, Pat Ryan, who's doing an excellent job. Uh, and our assembly delegation, uh, Kevin Cahill and Jonathan Jacobson, who represent these two towns as well. Um, and I'm going to be in the community a lot. I have a town hall scheduled September 10th um, in Southern Ulster County in Marlboro. Uh, and I hope folks will come out uh, 9 a.m. to 10.30. Uh, and it's one of 10 town halls uh, I'm doing over the summer. Yeah, I meant um, to ask you about that. We, I think we did before, but, you know, people say, well, when they're not in session, what are they doing? I'm doing a lot, you know, I, uh, and I know many of my colleagues do a great deal of work in the districts. I can't speak for everyone, but I, uh, you know, I, the, I'm still putting in those 60, 70 hours a week. I'm meeting with every senior club that is willing to have me in the district, working on legislation, being out there and, and uh, figuring out constituent issues uh, and solving problems that don't require legislation. For example, uh, my office just relocated to the city of Newburgh, 47 Grand Street, yeah. which is you know the Shout closest uh, location for uh, Marlboro and Platykill, and we welcome that any time. But one thing that we're looking to do in the city of Newburgh, there's graffiti everywhere, right? Uh, it's a blight. Um, it, it affects property values. It's just not something that you generally want. And I'm not, about, not talking about the art. That's different. Um, this is, you know, the scribbles that are everywhere the on tags. private property, the tags. Uh, so what we're doing is we are uh, purchasing power washers and we're going to go around and remove this graffiti. Uh, you know, that's not something obviously that requires a bill. Uh, that just requires, you know, sort of a, uh, a proactive attitude. And that's what me and my staff have. And we're going to be working very hard to uh, meet as many people as we can and certainly, you know, improve our communities that we represent. Okay, well, uh, Senator, it was good to have you. Thank and, you. Uh, and we will we'll do it again, uh, particularly as the election um, uh, years around. We'll probably have debates if you do have an opponent. Uh, and uh, and we'll, 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 we'll definitely have you back, but thanks for coming on. Of course, thank you. All righty. Give me one second.